we're going to Matthew chapter 28, or no, sorry, 25. Now we've gone over the first two parables, uh, Matthew chapter 25. Um, we had the parable of the ten virgins, if you remember the little lamp, and uh, five of them were wise, and five of them were foolish, and uh, so the five wise ones were sitting there waiting when the bridegroom came, and the five foolish had run off looking for oil, and then we had the parable of the talents, and you had... Um, the one who got five talents and he did something with it and another one got two talents and he did something with it and the third one didn't understand and didn't trust his master didn't believe his master thought his master was hard and uh, hid his talent his money under the ground and gave it back to the master whenever he showed back up so uh, there's two words that I didn't mention through all of those parables and several other parables that we've gone through um, that I'm going to mention today. We've got the sheep and the goats. And one of the things that I noticed is you have people who profess and you have people who possess. So you have people who profess that they know the Master and they love the Master and they trust the Master, and all it is is Word. The guy who took the talent and he stuck it in the ground and hit it did not really know the Master. He didn't really know God. He just had an idea of Him, and his idea was screwed up. He didn't trust God. For us to believe and trust in Jesus, we are allowing Him to run our lives. We trust Him with not just our day, but with our soul and our eternity. That's not what the guy with the talent that stuck it in the ground did. And that's not what the five foolish virgins did. So, today we're doing the sheep and the goats. So, uh, verse 31. <clears throat> when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels around Him, He will sit on the throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before Him and He will separate the people one, at, one from another as a shepherd separates sheep and the goats. He will put the sheep on His right and the goats on His left. The king will say to those on his right, the goats, or I mean the sheep, the ones who've really trusted in him, come you who are blessed by my father. Take your inheritance and kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. <clears throat> I was in prison, and you came and visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? They're not understanding. When did we do that? I don't remember ever seeing you on earth and doing that for you. When did we see you as a stranger and invite you in, needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick and in prison and go and visit you? The king will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers, you did for me. Whatever you did for the needy, whatever you did for the poor, whatever you did with someone who was in great need, you did for the Lord. And then, they will, then he will say to those on the left, Depart from me, 
you who are cursed into eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you didn't clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will, will, will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for the least, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment but the righteous to eternal life. These goats are the same as the people in another part of Scripture where they say to Jesus, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name. We did miracles in your name. And he's saying, go away, I don't know you. There's a difference between you thinking you know who God is and God knowing you and being in a relationship with you. And it's worth shouting about. There's a difference. And uh, I don't know how theologically sound this is, but a, a visual thing sometimes helps us understand a lot better. And that was the whole idea of the pencils and the pen. The kids can understand that. Um, we older folk can can uh, picture things a little differently. We're going to look at three chairs. We're going to look at the sheep, the one who's trusted in Jesus, who at some point has given their life to Him, who've trusted Him, believes that He died for their sin and rose from the dead and that they will spend eternity with him. That's the first chair. And our second chair is very similar. So this is why I'm saying I don't know how theologically sound this is, but it helps us to look at ourselves and see where we're sitting. And that's the whole idea here, to see where you're sitting whether you're sitting in the kingdom of God or whether you're sitting in the kingdom of darkness and just thinking you're in the right kingdom. Remember, these people thought they were following God and they didn't do what God wanted them to do and he said, go away from me. We don't want to be in that group. We don't want to think we know him and not really know him. So this is kind of what people call the fence sitters. They sit in between God and eternal punishment, hell and the devil, and they go, which side do I want to be on today? Do I want to go and do all the wrong things and ask for forgiveness later? Or do I want to do what's right? So where this, where this is theologically, I don't know. But it matters where you end up. And you take time and you think about, have I really trusted in him? Do I really give all myself to him? Well, the third chair is the goat chair. The third chair is the chair of eternal punishment. And you can, in this world of Rob Bells and love wins and universalism that everybody gets saved, eventually, because God loves us all. God loves us all. But He hasn't forgiven us all. <laughs> Unless we trust in the way that He's given us, in Jesus, we have not been forgiven. <clears throat> there is. Jesus used the words. Depart from me, you who are cursed. That doesn't sound positive, does it? into eternal fire, eternal, forever, 
fire, painful if you're in it, prepared for the devil and his angels, not prepared for you. You weren't supposed to go there. But we've fallen, we've sinned, and we're headed there unless we move chairs. Remember, these are Jesus' words. If we get out another kind of Bible, not mine, you got red letter Bible, those are in red letters. That's Jesus. You know, the one who is love. And he also warns us. And he says, verse 46, Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. There's, a, there's different places. Where are we going to be? I don't know. Maybe we're kind of born in this seat. <laughs> if we're born into a Christian family. Maybe you're born into this seat. If we look theologically, we're all born here. But some of us have a little better chance. If we're born into a Christian family, you're, you're raised up from the time you're Zoe's age, and you get told, get, get the little picture Bibles out. Where'd my Bible go? Where? Oh, I just, okay. See, our eyes can play tricks on us. I'm a sleeping goat. <laughs> We're from a little age, we get shown all the pretty little picture books, and we get told the truth. <laughs> yes, this is the one I use. I just do this one to make everyone think I can read. <clears throat> so, uh, we're, we're raised up and told these stories, and so this is kind of where I was. When I was born, I didn't get read these every night, but I got dragged to church every Sunday, and uh, so I thought, I knew there was a Jesus, and I knew he died on a cross, but I didn't want to have anything to do with him as I lived my life, and uh, so there I was in that middle chair. I knew the truth, but I hadn't really accepted the truth, and I was living over here. A uh, guy I was listening to last night, or yesterday, Todd Agnew has a song. He said, if you're looking for consistency, don't look to me. Because I got my hands, I'm holding hands with heaven while I'm making eyes at the devil. That's where I was. I thought I was all right because I knew the truth, but the whole time I'm making eyes with the devil. <laughs> and if you want a... Uh, Another look at this, we can look through the Bible and we can see all kinds of people in these spots. Um, but I want, I want us to look at Judges chapter 2. If I got something right. Judges chapter 2. And verse 6. After Joshua had dismissed the Israelites, they went to take possession of the land, each to his own inheritance. The people served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua. Joshua was right here. Joshua was in the first seat. He wasn't always there. Before he was kind of the second man, you had Moses. Moses was in, in the seat. And Joshua got brought along from knowing to really sitting in the seat. So Joshua, they took the land, people were going into their inheritance, the, the people served the Lord for the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him. So there was a group of elders who were along with him, um, who had seen all the great things the Lord had done. So I'm going to skip ahead just a little bit, verse 10. Um, after the whole generation had been gathered to their fathers, so all the people who had been with Joshua, they had walked across the, the river, they saw the walls of Jericho fell, fall, they saw it. They, they may not have been the ones who brought it on, but they saw it. They saw God work. After all those generation had died, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord 
nor what they what he had done for Israel. <clears throat> so you got Joshua, you got the elders, you got Joshua, the one who spoke to God. He's standing outside um, before they're crossing the river, and the angel of the Lord comes face to face with him. He says, whose side are you on? Ours are our enemies. And he says, I'm not on anybody's side. I'm on my side. I'm, on, I'm the head of the Lord's army. Joshua knew God. His elders, maybe some of them, weren't in that close a relationship, but they knew the Lord. And they saw what he did with their own eyes. They saw the Jordan open. They saw the walls of Jericho fall down after the priests walked around it and tooted their horns. So they knew God was real. But the next generation, they didn't know the stories. They didn't know the Lord. And the whole generation... is lost. They didn't know the Lord. Let's jump down. Um, verse 17 tells us a little farther along in the story. Yet they would not listen to the judges, but prostituted themselves to other gods and worshipped them. Unlike their fathers, they quickly turned, away, turned from the way in which their fathers had walked, the way of, of obedience to the Lord's commands. That seat over there, they didn't follow the Lord, they didn't listen to the Lord, they didn't pay any attention to the Lord. <clears throat> Our first chair here is commitment. You have committed your life to Jesus. You've given it all. The second chair is compromise. They know the truth, but they don't always follow the truth. They prefer to do what they want. And you'll look in Judges and you'll see it a hundred times. The people did what was right in their own eyes. That's where our world, where our country is right now. Whatever seems right right now, we're going to go ahead and do it. That's not the Lord's way. You do what's right, not what seems right. So that's compromise. Here's where I say, I don't know theologically all that. Maybe a sheep can be in this spot and really know the Lord, but I would make sure I was sitting over here. <laughs> because as a lost person, I knew that Jesus died on the cross. It's just like in James it says, the devil knows Jesus, but he ain't following him. They're not going to be in heaven. They know that it, they know that God is real, but that that's where the problem goes. Well, I believe, I believe, I believe. Well, is there anything behind your belief? <clears throat> I I can I can say I believe my daughter can drive. <laughs> She's just learning to drive. There's a big difference between me saying I believe she can drive. And going exactly, that's where I'm going. And there's a difference between putting her behind the wheel, me getting out of the van, walking 50 feet down there, and tell her, "Okay, drive up here and stop." I'm believing that she can drive, but in that, I'm trusting her. I could probably trust that Tara could do that. <laughs> But I don't know for sure whether I do that with Julia because we're starting. We're, we've been driving around the uh, the driveway, and she doesn't quite know which is the gas and which is the brake yet. So she was doing two miles an hour coming to the to the to the road, and she's getting ready to turn, but she's pressing on the gas instead of the brake. So I got a little scared and got a little hey. So there's a difference 
between believing, having a, a knowledge, and really trusting in it. And really, really, really believing in it. I can believe that that chair will hold me, but I haven't proved it until I really trust in it. And that's the believing and that trusting. So, Joshua's here, the elders are here. Then you have the next group of people who didn't get the stories, didn't get the nice little picture books, didn't get told this is what God did. This is how we got this land. This is what these stones next to the river mean. So, if you go through the Bible, and we can go through the Bible, and we can go through all the different people, but we're not going to do that. Because it's too hot. Um, you got people like Samson. You got Samson. Samson was here. Samson knew the Lord. Samson knew that God did wonderful things through him. But, God, but Samson also liked the Philistine women. And he also liked all the wrong girls. And uh, he, uh, he, he did all the things he wasn't supposed to. He wasn't supposed to touch a dead animal. But he killed the lion... And after the lion had laid there for a while, he stuck his hand in it and got the honey that the honeybees had left in his mouth. And he ate it. And then he gave it to his parents. That's the seat of a second chair person. That's not somebody who's just doing everything God wants him to do. He's doing what he can get away with. How close to this other chair can I get and still be a sheep? And that's not God's point. So there's Samson in the middle of that. You got David. David spent a good section of his life in this chair. But we all know stories where David heads off to watch the girl taking a bath on another roof. And he takes a good trip down to this next chair. But a person of God shows him his his wrong and he goes back to that first chair. Well, his son, he had lots of sons, lots of sons, and he had lots of wives. <laughs> and that causes lots of problems. So uh, his son that gets to be picked to be the next king, Solomon, Solomon, I think, was in this chair. He said some right things. He asked God for the knowledge to do what was right to lead his country, but then he, it's unsure how many wives David had, he had eight or nine, and uh, don't know how many kids he had. I, it's eight or nine wives, that was sure. But the number of kids that he had between all those wives are unsure. He could have 50, 60 kids. Solomon could not be outdone, so he had like 900 wives, and who knows how many children. He was definitely here, headed to here. Um, and he gets... From those wives, he starts worshiping some other gods by the end of his life. Though he was the wisest man that ever lived, though he was the richest man who ever lived, he was still sitting on that fence, leaning over as far as he could to this other chair. You got uh, people like Paul. Paul, I don't know, I think he sat in this chair his whole life. <laughs> Even though he wasn't with the Lord yet, he still did everything he could to be with God. <clears throat> then you have people not... Oh, okay, here's another one. Abraham. This, this one was a good example. This, the whole three-chair bit, this is from a guy named Bruce uh, Wilkinson, the guy who prayer Jabez. That's where I got this idea. Um, but he didn't have this and as I'm looking, I found Abraham. You got Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And uh, perfect three chairs. Abraham knew the Lord, trusted the Lord, ready to sacrifice Isaac on, on the altar. He knew God. He made a few mistakes, but he was in the first chair. He had Isaac. You don't really hear a whole lot about Isaac. And... 
he knows the Lord. He knows of the Lord. But there's not great feats of faith that you read about. Then you get Jacob. Jacob's name means... What's it mean, Jacob? <laughs> Sir Planter. A liar. His name means he's a liar. <laughs> His brother's coming out and he grabs him by the heel and drags him back in. Um, he, uh, he's He's definitely in the third chair. <laughs> He's not walking with God. He's doing whatever he can do to finagle his way to get what he wants. But then he meets God. And he wrestles with God. And that's what each one of us has to do. We have to wrestle with God and get out of here, out of complacency, out of apathy, out of mistrust and grab a hold of God the way Jacob did and say, I'm not going to let go. I'm not going to let go until you bless me. And Jacob got a hold of God and God got a hold of Jacob so much that his walk was forever changed. He, he walked from then on with a strange gait, whether he dragged the foot, whether he stumbled along, whether he had a cane, I don't know. But it was changed. His walk was changed, and our walks need to be changed. We need to get out of the second chair of, of uh, not being compromising, and we need to be spending our lives in the first chair. <clears throat> so then you have people like me, like I was saying, that I was told all the stories, but I wanted to spend all my time over here, and then God got a hold of me and changed my walk and my life. You have people um, like Martin Luther, who tried to get a hold of God, and he tried and he tried, and then God got a hold of him. And uh, same thing with John Wesley. And... Uh, different people in church history. But my question is, where are you? Are we in the first seat of, of being completely turned over to Christ? Are we in the middle seat compromising everything? <clears throat> are we in the third seat of confusion. We don't really know God. We don't really know who He is. And we think He's like a harsh master who, who uh, reaps where He hasn't sown, where He takes where He hasn't given. And that's what the, the one guy with the talent thought. He didn't have a clear picture of God. So uh, you have a person in a personal relationship with Jesus. You have somebody in a religious relationship. And like I said, theologically, I don't know where this lies. You're on a fence, and I really don't believe there's fence theaters. I think you're here or here. Um, but uh, you're in a religious relationship. And the religious relationship, maybe you know enough of God, maybe you don't. I don't know. But I don't want to be here. I don't want to be here. I want to be here. And this is what Jesus says. I wish you were either hot or cold. If you're in the middle, I'm going to spew you out. And the word means vomit. That's how sickening that is to him. I don't, God doesn't want us to be lukewarm. So you have the personal relationship. You have a religious relationship. If I do this, then he'll like me. If I do this, then he'll love me. If I do this, I'll go to heaven. The only way for us to get to heaven is not acting the right way. The only way is to trust that Jesus Christ gave his life as a sacrifice for all my sin. That's the only way I get to heaven. It's not by what I've done, it's by what he's done. 
So you have the religious relationship, and you have no relationship. And you, you can just go out in the world and find all kinds of people there. You go in the church and find all kinds of people here. But which are they, really? Are they sheep, or are they goats? And that's where we have to spend time and wrestle with God. Where am I? Am I really trusting you? Am I really believing you? You know what? In, in a year from now, I know I'll be able to trust Julia. And I'll be able to stand in front and allow her to drive the car up to here. I'm not doing that yet. So if you, if you know, and you know what I'm going to do? Is we're going to spend time driving. Until I know she can drive. And then she'll have the ability to drive out on her own. <clears throat> That's the way it is with Jesus. Is we have to begin to know that we can trust Him. We need to give parts of our lives that maybe we haven't given yet. And trust Him with them. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for loving us so much that you gave us your one and only Son. Lord, so we don't have to be jumping back and forth. We can come to know you. We can trust you. We can believe your word. We can read your word and believe your word. And we can be in that first chair. And we can be the sheep. We can be not just loved, but forgiven. Why? For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world con to condemn the world. You didn't send your Son to condemn me. You sent your Son to save me through Him. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned. We're not condemned. So Lord, I just pray that in all of our lives where, where we're leaning on that second chair, Lord, that you would give us the strength to move and to stay completely in that first chair.